and my 4K camera is now rolling. This is my home lab, and you'll see a box right behind me. Tonight, an unboxing of perhaps the world's first Supermicro Super Server SYS E300-90. What's a 90? That is a Xeon D2100. So it's a follow-on to the Xeon D1500 that came out about three years ago. I'm going to be moving the camera around a little bit, and I'm going to spare you looking at me the whole time. Now, let me get make sure focus is on the servers and the gear here. All right. Here is the box. Why do I have some other stuff around? Well, you might be interested. A little teaser will be a decibel meter here. So the decibel meter will help us read audio levels. And here's a FLIR thermal camera. So I got all the goodies queued up and ready to go. So when I open this box, we have some fun stuff to do together here. As I have a close look in my usual manner under the hood. All right, let me get started. Now, this is only a loaner that I have for about 40 more days or so. Just point that out. This is not actually my own box. And the Xeon D2100 series uh, worries me a little bit, frankly, because when you stick it in a tiny half-length, half-depth, 1U chassis like this, you greatly limit its storage options for fun stuff like NVMe storage right over here, for instance. So that will limit, you know, options a bit. All right, here we go. It's there. All right, here's the box within a box. It's no big deal. I am nowhere near the server. It's double box. Very nice. All right, simple little briefcase kind of packaging here. And someone's uh, written some information on there. And here we go. There's my serial number and all the details on the system. And now it's time to get the camera a bit closer. But I'm just going to point out, as you read the MAC addresses here, if I do DHCP MAC address reservations, you'll see two numbers next to each other. Uh, 51 and 50, sorry, 50 and 51. So that's ETH0 and ETH1. The IPMI is going to be this MAC address ending in 65. So that's how you read the MAC addresses off the label. That can be helpful for doing things like DHCP reservations. All right. I'm going to go ahead and break the seal and open this up. So again, I'll point out this is not a generally available system. I just had an inquiry last night about this. And naturally you might be wondering, does this replace Xeon D 1500? Well, as others have stated, ZND1500, whoa, there we go, lock focus, all right, ZND1500 here in the mini tower, that's powered off right now for quietness for you, that is a more versatile platform, I got ESXi 6.5 updated to 6.7 later tonight over there. Now, that versatility in a mini tower allows you to do things like, with this creative use of a ribbon cable, get four NVMe drives added to the side and another on the motherboard, that's five, plus four drive bays here, plus two 2.5 inch drive bays. You can jam a lot of storage in this, okay? That's the point of uh, having that there. Now, these are iFixit kit a little later. Here we go. Moving the camera closer as I said I would. We're gonna have a shot now at the box, the we'll unboxing. Okay, I've got a little more tape to break here. So yes, I have my concerns about the versatility and how we're crippling it quite a bit by going with such a small form factor. So it's got you know, advantages and disadvantages. There's a higher memory bandwidth, the ZND, and we go all the way from the former limit of, whoa, that's a weird camera angle, former limit of uh, 128 gig of RAM. Now we're at 512 gigs, so half a terabyte of RAM in a home lab. That's astoundingly expensive and unlikely to be affordable anytime soon. So I'm not sure how relevant that stat is, but for people that say NSX in a home lab or something, that could be very relevant. All right, Let's see the best way to unbox is probably something like this. All right, the box is now not quite empty. Let me uh, get the camera to keep from drifting like that. That was very weird. Like I said, there's gonna be mistakes, right? <laughs> All right, there's two boxes inside there. Let me um, get the camera locked. All right, camera is now 
hopefully going to stop drifting on me. Um, everything is tightened and it still seems to keep drifting. Okay, I have cranked it down now. There we go. Let's start with this box. And by the way, this workbench and this home lab, you haven't seen before. First time on camera I've revealed that. I have more parts I'm waiting on, so I'm going to show you that at a later date. You didn't come here for that. Uh, you came here to see a power supply. <laughs> We're good. All right, I'm going to uh, unbox that. The other nice thing about this workbench is I have outlets everywhere, so no issue there. And I even have a watt meter nearby so we can measure things like phantom power draw as needed. All right, so power is ready for a little bit later. Let me get into unboxing the next box, and that is a bunch of internal parts for wiring. So we've got ourselves a SATA on power connector here with, this looks a little different than what I'm used to. So we're gonna to wanna to take a close look at that in a moment. And an angle bracket, but it doesn't actually have the riser itself. So this would be for putting in PCIe cards. We're gonna talk about that later, and then a back, a blank back plate, as well as some screws. Let's get focus on there. Okay, I'm still experimenting with lighting, working out the kinks in my LCD panel overhead lighting home lab area here. All right, I'm gonna set that stuff aside. We're probably not really gonna use that. I'm mostly focused on getting you visibility onto the features of the motherboard. All right, but we do have something interesting going on here. What is it? So we have their proprietary connector. If uh, I were to Google that and look it up, we'll see a description of it. But that is a unique form factor here. That is definitely not in the ZND 1500 series. All right, and then looking at the other end, we have standard SATA, L-shaped connection. All right, so what we're looking at here is, just I happen to have one of these nearby, uh, but I don't have the drive open or out. Um, well, anyhow, we'll talk about U.2 and all that as time permits, but yes, this is Intel's uh, version that comes with their Optane 900P drive. Okay, so that should look familiar. So, interesting, Supermicro is now shipping a U.2 connector for you, if you haven't seen one of those before. All right, cool, moving along. Put that back in the box, a little cap. All right, finally, what you've been waiting for, the server itself. Let's get the lighting situated here. Looks like we might have some uh, reflections. Hopefully this is good now. Drift problem is fixed. Here we go. It was fun being first in the world and have your hands on something. And there we are with the back and the bottom. Not quite the way I should be opening it, but let's tip that over. Ta -da. Okay, you can see the fan openings there. And there's not gonna be much to look at on the top other than someone else's fingerprints a little bit. Like I said, this might be some early release here. All right, time for a look at the back panel here. All right, the lighting looks good. So clearly we have USB 3.0 with the bright blue there, power on the left, USB times two, IPMI ethernet for management, blank plates all over, a one gig, sorry, 10 gig and 10 gig. So that's gonna be the X557 is my understanding when I did some research on this. All right, VGA, and then a metal plate that has not been punched out. So you have to actually break it open if you're gonna be using a PCIe card. And then finally, a little dimple here for not sure what. On the side, we have more venting. And we have some screw holes, threaded holes, in case you're doing a one-u kind of bracket adapter mount. More threaded holes there. To the very close look at the front bezel here. See wires just a little bit with light aiming straight into the grill. Not likely to be seen in normal use. And then finally, a familiar bezel. This looks an awful lot like the 
E308D's chassis used for this E309D. I believe it is the same part number. Here we have a serial number that is for the system, I guess. Yep. So they don't put that on the back, they put that on the bottom. And we do have some nice rubber feet here. So I should be able to rest this uh, directly on my workbench here. Let's have a look at that. Yes. I have to exert quite a bit of pressure to get it to slide at all uh, from vibration or fans or any of that. So I have no worries there. Okay, getting the camera a little lower now. Time to open this up and have a good look under the hood. Now, I'm going to need a screwdriver. Luckily, I have all my tools near me. That's one of the reasons for building this home lab, workbench, slash studio, whatever you want to call it, so that I can kind of just keep the camera rolling and, and get stuff done quickly, ideally, sometimes in one take. Obviously, I do plan to do more 4K video editing at some point, but for now, it's a pretty arduous, painful, and ridiculously time-consuming process. All right, I'm using a PH1 Phillips. From what I remember, it's been um, pretty close to two years since, let's see, when did I get the first E300? Almost two years ago, I think. Yeah, getting ready for VMworld where I demonstrated back in uh, August 2016. So summer of 2016 when I had one of these. Right now it's mid-May. All right. So once you open it up with the two screws, you've got a little more work to do. I see they've got three fans in here. Very nice. What we've got is two more screws right there. So this design again is rather familiar to me from the last time around. Are these screws identical with what I took off? No, those are painted black. These are silver. That screw is a little bit loose, but we know another person's been in here. Not really a surprise. All right, so you slide this, and you notice there's a third screw. Oops. Not the first mistake I've made on camera here tonight, and it's not going to be the last. All right, three silver screws, two black screws, and we're in. Here comes the good part, seeing the actual motherboard here. Okay, you tilt this up carefully, and ta-da, huge heatsink. All right, so this is what I've been waiting for, a close look at the server. So it's time to lower the tripod even more. And point out some features. For one, PCIe, how would we use that? Well couple things. Remember that riser I showed you earlier? That is full length PCIe. So that's not going to cut it, although notice how it would cut right out the back. So full length by 16 lanes, you can plug in that type of cable, but that was never the intent. It's by eight lanes. So I'll just point out that. That's kind of crippling item number one, that you can't get all four of these running at full speed on one eight line, eight lane PCIe slot. So it's kind of a shame right there. Uh, item number two that's really apparent, clearly we're not looking at Flex ATX here, this area is doing nothing. All right, so here you've got a system that's wide enough for a, a bigger motherboard with maybe two PCIe slots like the other, the E308D from la uh, two years ago had, and this time, no such luck. Third thing to point out, you still need a riser card. You need to put in that right angle bracket kit that I showed you earlier along with a riser card, which I don't have. So I won't be able to use the card laying down, half height, half length card in the slot as it was designed. That's fine. I'll just stick stuff right out the top if needed, right? <laughs> just to kind of uh, get it done. Let's do an example of that. Do I have something nearby that'll fit? Well, I'd have to take the back plate off of it. And it just so happens I've got a video card here with no back plate installed. So that's handy because should be able to fit it. Notice the full length here. So, hmm, another problem. We got metal in the way. So this would need to go. And remember I told you that pops right out for any kind of PCIe cards. Clearly that's something they're going to want to do. And that means literally kind of breaking the metal there, popping it out so that you're able to 
expand and do stuff. So a little bit of force needed. And there we go. Put that back in the goodie box that it came with. And now let's see if I'm able to fit a card in here and experiment. Helps if I put it in correctly. All right, so it's keyed, of course. You can't really make a mistake. And there we go. So I'm able to use this in kind of a home lab, open air situation. But problem number uh, four, I suppose. This thing's gonna get really hot. <laughs> I'm gonna have to get creative. There's no active cooling on here. And the package, the system on a chip design, has a new size CPU fan. So I can't just grab something like the SNK 057 4L that I happen to have lying here from the Xeon D1500 days because that kit won't fit at all. And you'll see a profound difference in size. This comes with pre uh, done with a thermal paste. Look at the difference in size. So, of course, the heat sink, the veins always go this way. Okay, so the screws are nowhere near the same kind of distance apart. And the thermal solution is probably four, five, six times as much aluminum, I would say, overall surface area. So this thing needs way more cooling. So that's kind of like, uh, well, kind of another ding, a little concern. If you're an absolute power user and you don't mind fan speed and this thing's gonna be far from you and you really need extra memory bandwidth for a whole lot of, say, concurrent VMs, and, the, and um, then maybe ZND 2100, you know, would be for you. And the price is awfully similar to the ZND 50, uh, 1500 before it. But again, um, you have to weigh your options. Is it worth it? And the numerous trade-offs I've already kind of shown you here. All right, what's another thing to show you? I believe they call this Oculink. Okay, so remember that connector I showed you earlier? It's keyed, so it only goes in one way. So to set up Oculink here, we would need to do something like this. And um, you know what? Maybe I'll be bold tonight. Okay, hang on. Let's see if I can get the camera to show you this without too much shadow. By the way, in an iPhone 10, you can't leave the LED light on the camera itself running too long. It gets warm and you end up uh, ruining the shot and it cuts out. So I'm gonna make do with ambient lighting, which is pretty darn good in my studio here. And we're gonna see that, again, it's keyed. It only goes in one way. It has a nice solid feel. I like that. Wow. Yeah, that really holds on. And presumably that green button lets me release it. And it even says the word release right on there. So and I can figure that out. Pushing the button and pulling. And it looks like I've already gotten it up a little bit. Yep, it's already loosened. Let's try that again. Come on, camera. Lock on, focus. Try again. Is it a simple form factor? Do I like it? Yeah, I like it. It seems pretty rugged. Releasing it. Easy. Good stuff. Including little tiny metal tabs. So when you press the release button, let's see what happens. So you can see that on camera. Um, I'm looking with my own eyeballs and I'm not really seeing what's happening. So the mechanics of the release are more visible from the side. You see the little tooth? Okay, pretty good. All right. Now, to install ESXi or anything on here, um, take some time. And, well, I don't have a lot of time for doing one cut roll here, right? So what I might want to do is take an ESXi 6.7 I already have installed on a USB key. That'll shave quite a bit of time off of here. Okay, now where am I going to put that? Well, that's my boot media, right? Just booting into RAM. Doesn't really matter the speed, USB 2 or 3. I found the boot time is the same. And let's just look. Does the motherboard have a USB header? And the answer is yes, right there. So with USB header adapters, which, let's see if I have one in the box nearby. Yeah, I don't think I have too many of them, but I have one here that's kind of an odd shape. It goes at a right angle. But that'll suffice for the purpose of this video. Um, I could do internal USB for my ESXi. However, this header has a problem. 
it is way too tall. Um, yep, I don't have the motherboard manual. I'm not going to mess with any of that. Here you've got some more unused header pins down there. Do we have obvious jumpers? The answer is we sure do. Okay, so over here, we've got a lot of jumpers. Okay, I'm going to have to turn autofocus back on. I want you to be able to see as I slide the camera across slowly everything that's going on in the motherboard there. So, cross-referencing things on the instruction manual should tell us exactly what all those hardware jumpers do. All right, how about a count of SATA? You can do that as well. One, two, three. Yellow is for SATA DOM. If you're not familiar with disk on module, SATA DOM is a good place to install the SXI with more resilience. A little more work to do things like disk cloning. You'll need like to boot an ISO with Linux and uh, do clonezilla or that kind of thing. Frankly, it's a lot easier to just work with USB. Or you can use USB image tool to do full backups of things like this before you go messing with it. All right. So for SATA and all, Oculink lets you break out to uh, U.2 devices. And if you get a card in here, an add-in card, you can get a whole lot more U.2. Okay. Uh, what am I going to use for mass storage after I remember to plug in ESXi itself? So let's put ESXi itself right here. All right. And I want to want to do some sound measurements. And then when, it, when an OS boots like this, we'll then see 10 gig lights come up once they've negotiated a 10 gig connection. So I'll just point that out that some folks have had an issue with updating to 6.7 if they have only a one gig switch around. The X557 can be uh, tricky there and there's some, uh, there's some commands you can do. There's some workarounds if you um, have an issue like that. That was on the, uh, let's see, it was on another motherboard that's similar, a ZND 1500 that had only two X557 10 gig ports. So if you have a one gig switch, how else are you gonna get your ESXi service console going? So I'll point that out. All right, probably enough talking uh, soon. I wanna get this thing booted. in. So next, uh, we'll need a mass storage drive. So maybe I'll pluck one out of the server over here. I think the, uh, the Intel Optane is over there, but here's the thing with Intel Optane. It may um, cause the bias to be a little crashy and weird. The 900P is a consumer drive. It's supposed to be more universally compatible, but I actually had the same issues with it as I had with uh, using a P4800X, which is clearly an enterprise drive. So just point out that we may have some glitches as I try out Optane uh, 900P in the mains, um, sorry, the U.2 connector there. So that's our hurdle number one to clear. If that fails, uh, it might be smarter for me to start with just plain old SATA for putting a VMFS file system on there. We're not trying to benchmark, we're just trying to see, does ESXi boot up just fine? All right, so here's a 900P that I just freed up and liberated from its enclosure, and we can get power to it through this connector. All right, I'm not going to bother probably removing that, that bracket that's from the other server. Um, so the next piece would be uh, power. How are we going to get power? And actually, I think now that I'm thinking here, um, I may not have what I need, right? It's trying to tap from a SATA cable. Um, hmm. I could really use a diagram right around now, but uh, it sure looks like the only place in the motherboard it could possibly fit is right here. It's keyed, it's the right size, and everything's color-coded, highly likely to be absolutely fine, but of course we need signal, so I need to situate the drive way over here. Now, is this, cam is this cable flexible enough to allow me to close the enclosure again? The answer is probably yes. No problem, other than massive short circuit. 
<laughs> these various uh, jumpers here. So I'm not going to situate it there. I'm just going to rest it on the side. By the way, I don't have a static mat here because it's quite humid out. I'm not worried about electrostatic discharge. All right. Next. So we've got at least one storage device and it's got power, right? We're just going to leave this SATA cable and dangling. We got power straight from the motherboard. Cool. Another hurdle to clear. Memory. They did not mail me memory. Uh, I was warned that might be the case, and I'm learning on camera with you uh, that that is the case. <laughs> All right. And here's some storage I might want to consider also. So a much easier way to get storage going, rather than worrying about SATA, let's just go with fast NVMe. And we get two of them. So this would be a good test of bifurcation. If we turn this slot into two uh, eight by eight, M.2 slots with this one card from the Supermicro will be in good shape. So all I gotta do to make that happen is take off the back plate. Sorry, no time lapse, no speed up, all done live tonight. All right, back plate removed, screws nearby, and now we have ourselves two M.2s, and there's some VMs on there already. Cool. All right. Now what's gonna be my problem if I leave the lid off like that? Well, overheating problems. In a hurry, because I'm not gonna have the airflow across the top. So without the right angle adapter, which um, scares me a bit, I'm gonna see if I can come up with an alternative. What about this Amfeld tech? device. Will this let me get M.2 in and the lid back on? And the answer is a resounding yes. Awesome. This is great having all my parts nearby. So I'm going to go ahead and install an M.2 NVMe SSD into that card. And we're going to forget about bifurcation for now because I'm more worried about overheating the box. And that would be uh, bad and sad. Public website doesn't list what type of memory to use. Is my existing 2400 memory for my existing super server actually going to work? And I never got an answer. They said, well, try it with the memory you have on hand and let us know if there's a problem. So that's what I'm doing. I'm pulling out four DIMMs from my nearby ZND 1541. And we're going to learn together whether it works or not, because again, the documentation on the website is lacking. I don't think there's a manual either. I mentioned a manual earlier. I don't think we have the luxury. In fact, the bias and IPMI are not even listed anywhere in the site because it says something like um, there are no later ones. So the website's still early days, but that's okay. It's not even shipping yet. That's the kind of thing you would expect. All right, time to get the memory in there. Here we go. Again, normally you would want an anti-static strap if it's the middle of winter. It is definitely not the middle of winter. We de-energized the motherboard, no concern there. And this cable is going to be an issue. So I'm just give it a little slack, and now I can put the memory dim in. No problem. So remember I said I'm going to put a speaker in there so it makes a beep? That's what I do on the Super Server bundles that ship from Wired Zone. On the mini tower, it's really handy to know when your system is done beeping. Kind of cueing you into when do you hit the um, right key to get into the BIOS or change boot order or whatever you want to do. All right, two clicks heard on each. All of them clipped in nicely. And cable, not quite long enough to go around, but it feels like it's not even going to touch. I'm not worried about that at all. Actually, I'm curious. Will it go in like that? And will it touch anything? Do I feel any pressure at all? Zero. That cable is not being touched or pinched. There's still clearance above the RAM. All right. Back to assembly here. All right, so it wasn't too bad putting in RAM. Probably the whole thing took, I don't know, three minutes, and then I'll be ready to plug in power. I should also get a monitor so we can see what the bias is doing on this 
But it looks like I'm going to have to uh, skip the speaker. Uh, no, I got it going. All right, we're good. All right. That's it. I'm done with USB on this system. So that's another thing. Uh, if you have a UPS, like uh, the one I'm showing in the background here, this guy. Um, if you wanted a USB signal cable to automatically shut down your ESXi host on here, uh, you only have one more port. So that's kind of frustrating. You probably want to use that USB header in the motherboard if you can find a way to jam everything in. So yeah, lots of little considerations here on this box. Turn this on. Can you see the kilowatt watts? The answer is barely. Can you see that this went up to 60 something? All right, so we got the Super Micro logo showing now. And what I could do is just zoom. There's really not much to look at in the server itself, right? All right, so at the bottom, and you're looking at 4K, so you no know, words and all, there's no hating. We're an hour into this video, and I'm ready to see that my IP address is 198, and we do have another PC off camera over to the left here, so we can get into IPMI if needed. Uh, but we got a keyboard locally attached too, so probably doesn't matter too much. When the fan is high like this initially, that's pretty normal. Speaker worked. And I completely missed the chance to go into the BIOS to configure things. Let's try it now. Press delete instead of entering setup. Okay, so the BIOS has a little bit of a new look and feel there on the main screen. And I should probably talk a little louder. Um, and crank up the brightness a little so you can see probably a little better. Okay, hopefully I got the contrast and brightness about right there for you. 82 watts at this point, and the fan seems to be staying high. All right, so 128 gig of RAM, or 131072 megabytes recognized. And the date is uh, off a little bit. It looks like we're universal, we're at, uh, no, I'm not sure what, whose clock we're on. Plus key, minus key. All right, so that's now the correct date. And the second hand was correct. Okay, bias is 1.0. Build date, March 1st. Well, that's kind of interesting to me. Um, why did it just beep in the background? Anyhow, yeah, there's the model of the motherboard X11 SDB-4C. So only four core, pretty modest machine here. TLN2F, and it keeps beeping a little bit. Boot features, quiet boot enabled to uh, obscure memory count and stuff. So let's turn that off so the next boot we can see a little more. I hate that I'm locked being on, not a fan of that. And then finally, um, I like to push and hold the button. And I also like to stay off until I power on. That's just my stuff I do. All right. Mm -hmm. There's some new stuff in here. There's the Xeon D2123IT. So now we get the model and the gigahertz of the CPU showing for you here. Intel virtualization turned on, so nothing you need to do for ESXi. Just let her leave it be. Let's go into this. Energy efficient is an interesting choice to ship it like that. Uh, okay, let's go keep looking around here. Up and down arrow is doing nothing. So you have to go to custom to be able to move these other settings. So I'll quickly show you all the settings. You can pause this video if you need to see something more carefully, closely. All right, heading back to energy efficient. Next. 
It's only a four core machine anyway. Like I said, I'm not gonna be focused on all kinds of benchmarking really. Mostly on ease of installing the SXI and so forth. Chipset, what do we got? Northbridge. Uh, lots of new settings and submenus. These might change quite a bit on the next BIOS release. In fact, you can probably expect that. Force PLR, what speed did we get? We got 2400, that's cool. So before, only the 8-core got 2400, everyone else got 2133. Looks like they fixed that. Nice. IIO, CPU. Okay. Oh, I'll show you everything, sorry. TPM, I'm going to leave it off. TPH, excuse me. And VTD, that's all on, so we're good there for passing through devices. Probably works fine. All right, Southbridge, what do we got? These settings look awfully similar to previous generation. Chipset. Okay. We don't have any SATA devices installed. And RAID is turned off. Was this machine a factory defaults? I don't really know. So look at all the SATA ports, right? It doesn't physically have that many, but it's capable of it. Interesting. Okay, S SATA controller. Hmm. Zero to five of those, so six of those as well. This guy, you could do offboard, onboard. I'm doing onboard video, which you're obviously looking at. Network stack, you can turn off IP 4 if you want. Cruising right through here. Okay, I don't think you care too much about serial. Serial Redux still there. Secure device is enabled by default. No TPM found though, no security device found. Interesting, okay. iSCSI, initiator, Ooh. Something different. And then virtual raid, VROC. Whoa. That's a shocker. Uh, yeah, that's a shocker. Uh, you remember I was showing you this kind of thing earlier? All right, with certain devices. Well, I, anyhow, that's a nice surprise. Uh, I thought it was gamer systems or whatever, but it looks like they're putting VROC on everything, including this. And we're not going to get um, an Intel VMD controller, though. So you're not going to be getting a raid out of M.2 devices uh, likely with this. I'm going to move on and uh, move over to the right here. Anything interesting going on in there? Not too exciting. That's me booting. So apparently it was cleared before it mailed to me. Didn't mail to me. IPMI. Yeah. BMC. We'll leave it at DHCP. I just got to remember 198 is how I get in. I hit up arrow to get to the bottom of the list. Okay. We're good there. Security. Administrator, nope. Secure boot. This is where you turn that on. All right, CSM enabled by default. That could be interesting for some folks. And that has some implications about legacy boot. So I'm going to go into UEFI. That's how all systems are shipped from Wired Zone for very good reasons. And I'm going to leave that off. And then finally, do I want a hard drive to boot? Like, suppose it found this Optane drive. No, not really. I want that Sandus to come up top of the boot list. And that's it. Uh, what do we see down here? What do we see? Do we see any evidence of what's going to happen with the UDAT 2? Not really. Save changes and reset. Didn't hang on A9, so the bias would hang on A9 if the Optane wasn't working. So it looks like the 900P is supported in this motherboard, and it just wasn't on the ZND 1500. It is my current thought there. All right, so here we are uh, watching the boot sequence in the bottom right. 4K resolution, if you have a decent monitor and full screen this, you should be able to follow along and see this. Pretty much at 64480, like it's showing natively here. Oh. Um, you've got way too many pixels. But yeah, I shouldn't have any trouble reading my fonts here. And I fixed the focus and the exposure. I'm watching the bottom of the corner, so we have a more verbose boot this time. We don't have the, um, the pretty boot that has the Super Micro splash screen going, right? Okay, memory recognized, boot finished, and we're probably about to get ESXi beginning to boot with any luck. 
and we should get the fan settling down, and a 10 gig connection negotiated. So we need some more network cables while we're waiting. Nice. That settled way down. Okay, normally, normally I'm a fan of using the thin cables, but I don't have one handy that's long enough for what I'm trying to do here with the 10 gig. So I'm going to go ahead and use a thicker, uh, I think it's CAT 6A cable. Yep, CAT 6A cable here for the 10 gig. And we'll see how we do. I'm going to plug it in this port. I want to see if you can see the light there. So once the OS comes up, let me take this out of 2x zoom. I just plugged in a cable here, and you can see some blinking going on. So how about I zoom in on the server now? No, oh, that's not too useful. Let's bring the camera a little closer here. Got our ESXi. Done. That booted pretty fast. All right. So we have IPMI here. And we have ESXi going, and um, very difficult to see LEDs. So let me tilt that up a little for you here. And now hopefully you can see some stuff. Can you see that? So we have amber on one side, and blinking on the other. So what we can do now is give you the 2x zoom again and go ahead and um, show you the network settings. So let me get this framed perfectly for you here. Yeah, it's not going to be perfect, but it's good enough. Okay, so now when I hit the keyboard, it's going to turn yellow again, but I got to make sure you have enough brightness. And proper focus. Okay, waiting for DHCP. So it's angry. It didn't find ETH0. So it doesn't look like it's happy. Um, well, that's interesting. Let's get into it. So I'm going to hit F2. I'm checking your numlock is off. Nope. Figure network management. And look at the network adapters. So we have two network adapters. NVM NIC 1 connected. So that's. Ah, so I was wrong. It's not an X552, it's an X722, or it's not an X557, excuse me. X552 slash X557 were used interchangeably by many people, talking about the previous. ZND 1500, but it was really called an X557 if you looked it up carefully. Whew, I'm talking quick. Um, but the Intel X722 is a different animal that I'm not used to. And uh, I guess the driver worked. So the X557 driver seemed to still work. So let's move that cable down. Let's move to the other port. And let's see if we get that to show up. Yes, success. Okay, IPv4. Use dynamic lab.local. I'm going to leave all that alone. Now, it's a little weird when you move USB from one to another. You can get strange things going on with MAC address. Um, well, the service console does interesting things. Let's restart the management interface. See what happens. Test the network. Boldly. I didn't even look at the network up-down status. And we have success. Good to go. Alright, so I now have server working. Next pieces are going to be showing you things like Watburn at idle. So let's get the camera at a wide angle now. 
and zoom in here and you'll see we're at 50, uh, 57, 56 watts or so with no VMs running, just the machine booted. Now we should be able to find some VMFS data store on there. So this would be a good time to now show you I cut over to a laptop. We'll point the browser to 198. We'll kind of take the, uh, the rest of the video from there. Uh, but that's not going to be 4K and that's not going to show up here. So before I go and do that, let me actually give you a look right on the screen. So I have another laptop handy that I'm going to use to finish up this video. Bear with me while I log into it and get it prepared. So what I'm going to do is show you Blogtop's monitor will log in to ESXi, we'll use host client pointing straight to the ESXi host and get a look at the hardware and RPM and thermals. And then we'll have an idea of uh, if everything's working uh, well with this machine, you know, as is. Um, anything else to show here? Let's see if the power brick is warmed up at all. Not really. How about the system itself? No. How about the decibels? So now we're about 18 inches away, which is similar to my videos from two years ago. Forty-four decibels. Okay. Time to do the fire up ESXi host client. So how are we gonna do that? Well, it doesn't have a name, it has an IP right now. We can do a DHP reservation. But for this purposes of this login, I'm just gonna do a 10.10.1.198. Chrome is annoying, certificate, usual stuff. And now we should be good to go. That's just the IPMI interface, right? Let's see if uh, HTML5 works, it should. And when I'm sitting kind of far away, I gotta, gotta see what I'm doing here myself in the room. All right. And it's not so comfortable on my lap. Okay. There we go. So, what's changed in IPMI? Uh, I don't, there's a few things up here. What the heck? Ah, support for Redfish. Interesting. Refresh the page. Exclamation. So, they've changed the uh, UI a little bit. IPMI has some tweaks that I had never seen before. So, in IPMI, we've got remote control, HTML5. I could have clicked that in the drop down or click it here. It should come right up, no Java needed, and we hit a key and we get the yellow screen. Nice. And actually the screen just came to life behind right there, right? <laughs> All it is is showing you the exact screen of the server over your web browser if you have never seen a super micro system like this before. Pretty simple. All right, uh, what else are we getting off of here? Well, it says DHCP told us an IP address of .21. So now I know how to get into the ESXi host client. 10.10.1.21. That actually has a name. That's the IP of the server I took it from. So it's going to complain about um, lots of stuff about certificates and all that. But guess what? If I just simply click on this icon, ZMD 1541-5028D, I believe that's IP address 21. And I was wrong. All right. Certificate warning, and we have an issue. It's not going to let us in. This is one of those issues where the certificate is uh, system-wide for all the other browsers, like Edge and stuff, but for Firefox, I should be able to still get in. So let me fire up Firefox. All right. Secure, add an exception, confirm the security exception, and we're in, almost. Oops. Got a cable in my way here. Did 
dismiss the little welcome. SSH is enabled warning. The usual there. And if you haven't seen 6.7 yet, you can actually just dismiss that right there and then license them in trial mode. All right, awesome. So we have RAM 128 showing for memory. CPU uh, 8.7 gigahertz, so that's the cores, uh, four of them times the gigahertz. Uh, the build number of 6.7 shown, and it appears I'm zoomed out a little bit. Well, maybe not. That might make it a little easier for you to see. All right, what else could I show you here? Well, it's health that I wanted to show you, right? So recent tasks, we can uh, shrink that down. And we can see the BIOS date and version, sorry. Serial number is looking wonky, but that's common on these motherboards. To be filled in by OEM is also a little sloppy with the asset tag. Uh, there are IPMI tools to handle that. The BIOS release date does not quite match what we saw earlier. It's a little, so it's a little bit odd. Host name uh, is correct. I just didn't wait long enough. So when I clicked that icon earlier, it should have worked. The CPU type shows. So yeah, we look like we have a good grip on hardware health and we can see two NVMe data stores, VMFSX, an Optane one, 260 gig, and an M.2 one. So this is awesome. Data store browser should work. And we could fire up something like Ubuntu. Register that. Now Ubuntu is registered and we should be able to boot it up. Um, and then we have a bunch of different Windows 10 um, instances here. None of them are built 1803 quite yet. This is actually a good one from a uh, public demo at that VMUG I told you about in New Haven earlier. Let's get that showing here. Is that the VMX file? I have to drag this sideways to see it all. VMDK, there you go. You want the VMX file and register the VM. So now we have some VMs registered, right? That's cool. Um, what else? Uh, I'll fire those VMs up. Maybe exercise, put a little load in a VM, and maybe we can get the, the, the watts up and the noise up a little bit. I would say the fan is staying, you know, maybe louder than I would like. Um, and remember I said I want to monitor or look at hardware environment here. Here's the hardware sensors. Looking good. Temperature in Celsius showing, voltage is showing, and how about RPMs? Fan speeds, yes. So we're at 5200, 4800, and 4500 on three fans at the front. All right, can we change those fans? Can we change the profile? Of course we can. We've got configuration and fan mode we can look at. And uh, that's a really tiny font probably for you. Let's crank that up a little too. Here's heavy IO fan. All right, wide angle the camera. Get the decibel meter again. I'm now blocking a lot of the sound with the laptop in the way. Oh well, we're gonna see a relative change. So 50, 40, 47 is gonna become higher. Here we go. So if that was anywhere near a bedroom or something, you'd be pretty annoyed. <laughs> um, so yeah. So standard, did that change anything? Um, how about we go and alt-tab our way back to Firefox. All right, 4800, for, did anything change? Yeah, I don't think so. Hit refresh here. All right, alt-tab our way back, crank it up again, and see if that's immediately reflected in the ESXi host client. show yet, but if we hit refresh, I'm sure it will. Hmm. 5200, 5100, 4800. Seems like uh, the change is even more dramatic than that, but all right. So I'm going to go ahead and bring that down again. 
Looks like optimal is the same as standard speed. Uh, is full speed even louder? Let's have a look. It's the two fifty one forty eight. All right, so optimal, you would think, uh, should be tuned to um, change with varying load. So remember, we got some uh, VMs going. So I should be able to uh, run a VM or two over on the Firefox side. Uh, there was one other data store we didn't really look at, so go back to storage. The Intel Optane 900U, 900P, excuse me, U.2 drive, I clearly labeled. And we'll look at data store browser there and also add something into inventory template. Uh, that didn't look so good because I don't have vCenter running on this network right now. We just have one host. Infrastructure planner plants. Okay, I don't have anything too useful uh, running on the Optane, unfortunately. But it will be interesting to see if Optane performance is uh, better now. So I could vMotion when I get a, a cluster built on 6.7. So I'll be testing that, of course, naturally. For now, no, no, no vMotion. All right, so we got some VMs. <clears throat> Power that VM. And Windows Update might have to do its thing. So what we could do to avoid that nonsense would be go in and edit the configuration. And turn off the network adapter. All right. Interesting that that came up, but all right, whatever. Okay, so we have our Windows VM going. And I don't know if it has network connectivity yet. <coughs> I believe it may have a benchmark or two in its drive. Let's have a look. So it'd be nice to have a way to exert a little bit of load. Right now we're at 74 watts. So we can get that to show for you off camera. There we go. 70 watts now. Alright, we have no networking because we told it no networking, right? Um, to avoid Windows Update from making things miserable while I'm on camera here trying to show you stuff. Here the fan came up a little bit. Okay, is the CPU busy? Not so much. How many virtual CPUs did I give it? 4 gig of RAM, 2.19 gigahertz showing in an ES6i VM. I think I'm ready to finish soon. Um, whether I get a way to crank up the fan or not, it'd be nice. Um, but again, you're probably going to really want to watch me recording with Camtasia and a vSphere cluster and putting things in Optane, comparing speed and all that good stuff. So that may need to wait.